What's going on, guys? Welcome back to WWE Network and show where I Graham Jason Matthews break down all the original content you watch on the WWE Network and on Peacock. And today we're talking the Woo! Becoming Ric Flair documentary that dropped the day after Christmas on December 26, 2022. Didn't have a chance to catch up on it until just today. Wasn't exactly rushing to watch it either, just because I've seen so many Ric Flair docs in the last... 14, 15 years from the one that WWE put out on him uh, right after he retired in 08, the ESPN 60, E60 or 30 for 30, whatever it was about five years ago. Um, that was great. That was great. But that was years ago. Um, they did another one, not really a full on Ric Flair documentary, but WWE did a 24 special on him two, two three years ago at this point. Um, I thought it was on his full career. It wasn't. It was only on the final match that he had in WWE, which is comical in retrospect, because that was 15 years ago at this point, and he just had his quote-unquote last match in 2022 um, over SummerSlam weekend in Nashville, so that was a well-done documentary as well. So I didn't have the highest of hopes for this, just because we've also heard a lot about Rick and a lot of the scummy shit he's been up to uh, that wasn't discussed in these docs, some of which was, but a lot of which was not discussed in these ESPN and WWE documentaries on Dark Side of the Ring. Dark Side of the Ring covered a lot of Ric Flair shenanigans from over the years, and specifically the Plane Ride from Hell episode that dropped back in September of 2021. So I can't imagine I was the only one who wasn't overly enthused to find out they were doing another Ric Flair documentary for Peacock. It ended up being quite good, actually. The production values that went into doing this was very different than your average WWE doc. It wasn't just the WWE 24, which are awesome, by the way, don't get me wrong, with the talking heads and the footage. A lot of footage, obviously, from his life and career, but the kind of focus on Flair himself, and the whole point of this documentary, really, was to find out who is Ric Flair now? Is he Ric Flair? Is he Richard Richard Fleer? You know, the, his original name before he had to change to Ric Flair uh, through wrestling and whatnot. Where does Ric Flair start? Where does Richard Fleer end? And the answer is, spoiler alert, it really doesn't. They're kind of one and the same at this point. Ric Flair even said at the end, the beginning, he doesn't really know uh, where one starts, where one ends. They're really just one and, the, one and the same at this point. He has lived that lifestyle for so long. He is Ric Flair. He is the pro wrestling character Ric Flair in reality 24-7. That's just who he is at this point. Uh, I did learn a lot about Ric as far as his early upbringing that I did not previously know as far as being adopted. I had no idea he was adopted. I'm sure, obviously, that's been discussed elsewhere. Maybe even in that ESPN documentary. I don't remember. Uh, but they talked about that. They talked about a bunch of other stuff as well. So this actually ended up being quite good. And dare I say, well worth the recommendation. I would recommend checking this out. It clocks in at around an hour 51, an hour and 51 minutes. So it is a bit of a watch, uh, but it's well worth it. Uh, the Ric Flair stuff is very interesting. I'm still not the biggest fan of Ric Flair the person. Will definitely go down in wrestling as one of the greatest of all time. Ric Flair, the person, a lot of the shit he's been uh, involved with and guilty of and accused of and whatnot, does not paint him in a very positive light, and justifiably so. You can't ignore that stuff. This documentary did. This doc made no mention of the plane ride from hell stuff, which WWE themselves did a fucking cartoon episode of. What was it? Story time a few years ago? I don't know if it's still up on Peacock, but it was at one point. They kind of made light of the fact that Ric Flair, not him swirling his penis around in front of a fucking stewardess, but you know what I mean, though? Like, the other shit on the flight, and oh, it's so comical, and in reality, it really wasn't. Like, women, and specifically that one stewardess that was interviewed in Dark Side of the Ring, was scarred for life from that whole ordeal. So, they don't mention that here. They don't mention some of the other controversies that have come out that have come out about Ric Flair in recent years. A lot of the dumb shit he said on his podcast, and I was really ruining his legacy by doing that. They don't acknowledge his TNA run. So, you would think, from watching this doc, he had his last match in 2008. Now, they do make mention of the Ric Flair last match event from 2022, as I mentioned, uh, and where he wrestled his final match, in addition to the fact where the following weekend he showed up at a pro wrestling show in Puerto Rico and <laughs> kind of made kind of made reference to how he plans to never retire. So they did acknowledge that. No footage from Ric Flair's last match, which was disappointing. Um, that was a big thing last year. It was actually also very well done. He looked like shit in the match, but the match was what it was. Uh, Jeff Jarrett did an amazing job, as well as Andrade and Lethal. But anyway, uh, no mention of the TNA stuff. He was there for a good period of time, so 
even even the fucking E60, the, e, the ESPN 30 for 30, five years ago, covered the Ric Flair TNA run. You kind of have to, because as much as they heavily focus on the drinking and whatnot, and how this really wrecked his body, going to rehab, immediately drinking upon getting out of rehab, and all this other sort of shit that has caused Rick's life of, you know, quality of life to deteriorate over the years. And he says now his health is phenomenal, he's doing great, nothing hurts. That's great, but I'm sure all the drinking he's been doing, probably not as much as he was a, a couple of years ago, five, six years ago, is not doing him any favors, is not helping him in the long run. Um, but to leave out the fact that he really, really, really did not want to retire and was so desperate to wrestle again wrestle again that he went to TNA, he wrestled there, he had a whole other run there, fucking embarrassed himself and some of the shit that he was doing over there. Um, I thought it was a bit weird that they kind of left that out intentionally, unfortunately, but they did cover a whole lot else that we've heard a lot about before, but most of it was interesting. And for first-time viewers, for anyone that has not seen that ESPN doc on Ric Flair, that has not seen the 08 DVD they put out on Flair 15 years ago, you'll probably be more captivated than your average pro wrestling viewer that does know about Ric Flair's career in life and trials and tribulations and everything else that's happened to him in the last you know, 30, 40, 50 years. So let's go back to the beginning here of the documentary. Again, the question is asked by narrator Tom Rinaldi. Who is Richard Fleer and who is Ric Flair and who is he? And he just says he doesn't know who Richard Fleer is, but he calls him the luckiest guy in the world. And he talks about Richard Fleer, who obviously is him. He is Richard Fleer. That's his real name. Um, but he talks about Richard Fleer in the past tense, which is interesting. He just says Ric Flair himself is the wildest son of a bitch who ever lived. His birth name is actually Fred Phillips, and he said he only found that out about three years ago. His parents' names were Olive and Luther, his real parents, that is. He was adopted, and he only actually found out he had a father, not a father, obviously had a father. He only found out he had a brother um, through, I think, they had the same mother, so through his mother he had a, another brother. Uh, he only found that out through Wendy, his wife, I think, now ex-wife maybe. They might be separated, I don't know if they're officially divorced. They were separated months ago, so they labeled her as his wife here on the dock. Don't know if that's changed or not, but anyway. Um, I guess the guy didn't want anything from Rick. Rick thinks that, oh, he only wants to reconnect now because he knows who I am and whatever. And Rick didn't want to meet him. He said, my past is in my past. I gained nothing from talking to him. What, are we going to talk about life, he says? He just goes, yeah, I had no interest. I had no interest in reconnecting with him because what does that really accomplish at this point? Um, he talks about being adopted from the Tennessee Children's Home Society in Memphis, Tennessee. And they were actually accused of stealing babies in the 1940s around the time that Ric Flair was born. So it's believed, albeit not confirmed, that he was a black market baby, as they call it. And he was put up for adoption legitimately by his parents. And he was stolen from, I think, one orphanage. Uh, got stolen from the orphanage and put in said building, Tennessee Children's Home Society, and was adopted by Kathleen and Richard Fleer. Uh, he doubts that they knew it was illegal because they were great people. They were very nice people, very smart, very educated. They, you know, Rick himself did not want to know anything else about it. I guess they talked to him about it when he was growing up upon finding out themselves. And he was like, it doesn't matter at this point. I'm happy. I love my life. You guys are great parents. I have no complaints. Um, he says that he was a daydreamer as a kid, what people now know as ADHD, he says. And he started drinking regularly at the age of 15, which is crazy. Um, he was such a wild child, he was actually put in private school. He always wanted to play football, and he did end up playing at a university in Minnesota. When he ended up flunking out, his parents, he said, were not surprised. He sold life insurance for a year about afterward, about a year afterward, he said, after flunking out of school. He got married to, I think, his first wife, Leslie, I think her name was. He got married for the first time, had his first daughter, Megan. Uh, started working as a bouncer, which is where he met Ken Patera. This was when Patera was not yet wrestling, but rather training for the Olympics. And at the time, he was sponsored by Vern Gagne. They started living together, I guess, and Flair started training uh, with Patera, with Vern Gagne. And it was actually Gagne who came up with the name Ric Flair. Rick wanted to be rambling Ricky Rhodes, I guess, because he was inspired by Dusty Rhodes. He loved his work and whatnot. And Ganya said, either that's a dumb name or whatever. Ric Flair itself is such a great name. That's such a great wrestling name. Use that. Obviously, his real name was Richard Fleer. But he said, you know, 
Gagne thought, you know, switching it up a little bit, Ric Flair would be better. And he was like, yeah, that's such a best, that, that, that's such a better name. So they ended up using that. He said he had his first match in Minneapolis, uh, went to a 10 minute draw, only made about 50 bucks from it. But that was the par for the course for, you know, wrestling back then on the independent scene and the territories and whatnot. That was really just what it was. You didn't make a ton of money, but you did drive a lot. You drove a lot from town to town, city to city, state to state to make ends meet. He said he spent the 50 bucks right away, which I was not surprised to hear, by the way. He said he actually drove Andre for about two years. They broke into the business around the same time. So he was actually driving Andre around for about two years. Uh, He moved his family to North Carolina, and he actually hired someone to fly him and a bunch of other wrestlers around the North Carolina area. That was where the plane crash happened. The real plane ride from hell, where this guy, because he had so many extra people on the plane, a small plane, he compensated for the extra weight by dumping fuel from the plane. And while they were in the air one day, I think it was October 4th, and the only reason why I remember that was because they said it here in the dock, and they also acknowledged it and talked about the story on um, uh, Tales from the Territories just recently, actually, on Vice TV, which I talked about here on the channel. So, one night when they were riding out on October 4th, 1975, the right engine went out, followed by the left engine. And they crashed, ended up crashing about 300 yards from the runway. And the pilot, I guess, was in a coma for about a year, I think ended up dying. Johnny Valentine, who was on the plane, was paralyzed from the waist down for the rest of his life. Ric Flair only broke, I mean, I say only, but it was still pretty serious, broke his back in three places, among other things. He was told at the time in the hospital he would never wrestle again. He was back in the ring within six months. Um, He started out real chunky in the ring, ended up dyeing his hair blonde, and then took the Nature Boy character from Buddy Rogers, actually. Obviously, that's been well known for decades. Um, He said his attire was inspired by uh, NFL great Joe Namath. His first robe, he said, would cost around $3,000. Got driven around in a limo to make it look like he was this hot shot, you know, big shot type guy. Got the woo, uh, got the woo catchphrase, uh, slogan, whatever, from... Jerry J from the uh, Jerry Lewis song, uh, Great Balls of Fire. Great Balls of Fire. Woo! And that's where he got woo from. A uh, bunch of the talking heads praised by, uh, Ric Flair for being one of the best of all time on the mic. Uh, include Triple H. They got The Undertaker on this dock. A lot of talking heads. Fucking Post Malone was on this thing. Mike Tyson, Stephen A. Smith. Um, a lot of people were involved in this documentary. He recalls being struck by lightning one time. So not only did he survive a plane crash, he actually cheated death twice by getting struck by lightning, getting off a plane while holding an an umbrella. And the guy behind him, I guess the lightning, bounced off of his umbrella and struck a guy in the eye and killed him. So, just crazy shit. He talks about constantly borrowing money from his father, whether it was to move to North Carolina or to buy his own house, which was like, I guess, $42 million. Did I hear that correctly? Because that's fucking crazy. He borrowed, I think, $200,000 from his father, which he ended up paying back the original installments for other stuff that he borrowed money from him from, or for, rather. He did not pay back, but he you know, paid back his father for that, which was good. Um, they talk about that and how he never felt good enough. Um, the Four Horsemen started in 1985. They talk about that, the uprise of the, or the uh, rise, rather, the upbringing, upbringing, the fucking rise in wrestling of the Four Horsemen. They talk about how he drank every night, constantly. He would always say on TV during his promos where he was staying, what hotel he was going to be at, because he says he has a disease and he loves women. And he says he's been married four times. His first wife, I think Leslie, like I said, told him, I can't live like this. Uh, Megan felt abandoned because he would never show up for shit. He was never there. He was never really involved in her life growing up for the most part. He talks about how strenuous that home life was. Uh, early on in his career and throughout you know, his peak in the 80s and 90s. They talk about the territories getting bought out by Vince. So in the end, by the mid-90s, it was really... By the mid-90s, it was really just WCW and WWF. So he joined WCW as part of NWA, which he was already doing stuff for anyway. Um, he talked about having to cut his hair, and he didn't really know who he was anymore. Uh, called Jim Hurd a fucking idiot. He had panic attacks due to this sort of due to the sort of shit. So he ended up leaving for WWF in 1991, and he actually sent Vince the WWE title belt, or rather the WCW belt that he had overnight, because he said to Vince, "I'm on my way in. I can come in at any point you want me." And Vince was like, "Bullshit." I ha- and, and Rick's like, "I have the belt. I can send it to you if you don't believe me." So he ended up sending him like overnighting the WCW big gold belt. Said he had self-doubt around that point. 
Um, Call the Royal Rumble 1992 when the greatest moment of his life, even 30 years later. Bruce Prichard, who was all over this thing as well, said that Ric Flair had not yet proven himself, the WWE at that point, the WWE audience rather, because it may have been a big deal to some, but to a majority of the audience, he says, they didn't watch WCW, they had no idea who he was, and in WWE, he wasn't the guy. He never really caught on, which I find to be fucking hysterical coming from Bruce Prichard of all people, but... I mean, listen, he wasn't the guy in WWE. He was never going to be with Hogan still there, among other people. Savage. But Ric Flair was still a top, top guy in WWE. A two-time WWE champion. Headline WrestleMania, not the main event, but in one of the main events at WrestleMania 8 for the WWE Championship. And it's not like he wasn't over. So, Pritchard, kind of the way he talks about it, kind of makes it sound like his WWE run was a fucking flop, which is hysterical. Again, coming from him specifically... So I thought that was interesting they included that. But by 93, Vince wanted to go younger, so Flair ended up going back to WWE, or rather WCW. He talks about how he has, or Charlotte rather brings up, because Charlotte's all over this thing as well, how he's had different relationships with all of his kids, David, Reed, Megan, and herself. Ashley is her real name. Uh, call her Charlotte here just to be, uh, so just so it's clear, I guess. Um, it was around that point when he went back to WCW within a couple of years, Bischoff took over. Eric Bischoff took over as the head of creative for WCW, among other things. And by the late 90s, NWO showed up and overshadowed Flair. So he wasn't as big of a deal as he once was. Bischoff talking about it now says he wished he, he wishes he could have been more reflective back then, realizing that what he was doing with NWO was also affecting Flair and other big top talent he had, that were being treated like shit from a booking standpoint. So at least he was a bit self-reflective on that, which I liked. Flair talked about how he didn't want his head shaved and didn't see what the point of that was. He claimed he asked time for time off. Bischoff didn't get the memo, I guess, because Rick wanted to go to his one of his uh, son's meets for wrestling, one of his wrestling's, you know, uh, one of his son's wrestling meets. And Flair, I guess, no showed in Bischoff's words, and because of that, Bischoff sued him. And Flair was pissed, he said. Flair said that Bischoff cost him millions, and they ended up turning it into a storyline, and Bischoff said that it was some of Flair's best work ever, because it was real. WCW ended up closing in 2001. Ric Flair, as we've heard a trillion times before, lost confidence after that. Already self, you know, already dealt with uh, self-confidence issues, but he really lost a lot of confidence after that. He would wrestle with his shirt on in the final months of WCW, started day drinking until returning to WWE in late 2001. Uh, Pritchard said by that point he was a shell of who he was before. Taker, though, still wanted to work with Ric Flair. Vince, I guess, gave him a couple of different options as far as, you know, these are people you can work with in Mania, including at WrestleMania, including Rob Van Dam. But Undertaker said this might be my only shot to work with Ric Flair, to work with the, the legend that is Ric Flair. And they ended up doing the match at WrestleMania 18, and it exceeded expectations, and actually ended up being a very good match. And Ric Flair on this point was still scared. He could not live up to the standard that people expected from him. Triple H wanted to help him, and thus Evolution was born. They talk about that. We hear comments from Randy Orton and Batista, Triple H, that I'm sure were all recorded many, many years ago. Um, but Triple H also brings up it was after Evolution ran its course by like 06, 07, People started to worry about Ric Flair being in the ring. Because Rick did not want to retire, but Vince saw the writing on the wall and said, Listen, you gotta go, buddy. You're fucking old. You're like late 50s at this point. He's not like having amazing matches at this point. You gotta go. So Rick admits he was felt he felt very insecure going into that WrestleMania 24 match with Shawn Michaels. Shawn said he took it very seriously. He wanted to honor Rick and being one of the greatest of all time. And he felt they did they did just that at WrestleMania 24. They recapped the match. Uh, from there, they talk about Reed and the sad story surrounding him and that Reed wanted to be in WWE. He trained to be a pro wrestler. Uh, Rick wanted to make him earn it. He actually competed in New Japan as well. They show footage of that, photos of that. Uh, Rick, meanwhile, remained relevant in pop culture. Uh, as for Reed, he did the WWE tryout at least once, failed the drug test, all of them, and uh, he couldn't go back for another year at least, I think. Rick gets very sad talking about how Reed had a meltdown every six months. He actually, Rick knew his drug addiction was bad when Reed wanted that Rolex watch that his parents had, uh, you know, said they were going to give him for years. They finally gave it to him and he sold it for drugs. And Rick knew at that point it was very bad. 
Uh, Rick and Wendy both recall seeing Reed for the last time uh, before he died in March of 2013, before the 911 calls played, which is really unsettling stuff. Uh, Charlotte recalls Rick calling her about Reed's death. She immediately got into wrestling. There was not a doubt about it. Didn't even know if it was something she wanted to do for herself, but she wanted to do it for Reed. And they talk about how she's really furthered her father's legacy in the last 10 years. They show footage of him accompanying her and helping her and joining her in her Raw Women's Championship victory back at WrestleMania 32 and him being there for it. Um, At that same time, though, he was going through a tough time himself. And it was years after Reed passed away, but he still hadn't really, you know, uh, you know, digested it, hadn't gone over it yet. He was dealing with that still, the ramifications of that. So he said that he drank every day from 10 a.m. to 2 a.m. He would go to sleep, wake up, drink all day again. And Wendy knew about this, knew he had an issue, went to WWE about it, talked to Triple H. Triple H called Rick and said, where are you right now? And Rick said, well, I'm in the car. Triple H said, turn around, head back to the airport, you're going to rehab. Rick said, fuck, no, I'm not going to rehab. And Triple H said, well, listen, if you don't go to rehab, you're not going to be able to work here anymore. So Rick ended up drinking before he got to the airport, at the airport bar. After he got out of the airport, before going to rehab, he drank a lot. And he said he was in there for 35 days. And as soon as he got out, he drank by going to the place across the street. He got a sobriety coin and went to a bar across the street and drank. I mean, the guy just doesn't give a fuck. By 2017, though, his body started to shut down. So the rehab shit did nothing. Started to shut down, his body did, from a number of different things, like a respiratory disease, illness, whatever, among many, many, many other issues that he was dealing with at that point. He was in a coma for 31 days, and the doctor said he had 15% chance of survival. He ended up having to do rehab facility work to be able to walk again for 30 days after getting out of the ICU. And when asked by Tom Rinaldi, the narrator... Why did he survive? Why did you survive? Ric Flair says, I don't know. And he said it meant everything for his daughters to be there. As far as why he continues to drink, he said he enjoys it. He goes, oh, why do you play golf? Because you enjoy it, blah, blah, blah. And it's like, well, golf's not going to fucking kill you, you moron. But anyway, uh, we don't hear from the kids or from Megan or Megan, I guess her name is. Uh, It's spelled Megan, but they pronounce it Megan. Megan or Charlotte about why he continues to drink. Like, I would love to hear that. I'm sure... They don't want to publicly bury their father, so I kind of get that. But still, I mean, I would love to have heard from them about, dude, why are you still drinking, and what are your thoughts on it? Because he's going to kill himself before long. I know he's like 70, what, 3, 4, 5 now? He's going to be dead within a couple of years. I mean, I hate to say it, but at this rate, at this point, he said he waits until 5 p.m. every every day to drink, until happy hour. And he went through his whole regimen. He went through his whole schedule and his routine. He waits until 5, he'll work out in the morning, do other shit, wait until 5, drink until 10, and then go to bed. They talk about how he's impacted the music industry and will be remembered as a trendsetter for all the woos and the chants and, you know, being involved with sports and commercials and pop culture and whatever. And he says right now he's in the best position he's ever been in. And Charlotte says that she hopes that he doesn't feel like he has anything left to prove, basically saying stay out of the fucking ring and just enjoy retirement, which he can't. He's incapable of doing so. As far as his legacy, DDP, Diamond Dallas Page, who was also on this doc, said that he will be remembered as the man. Hulk Hogan calls him the greatest of all time. Wendy, his wife, or ex-wife now, I'm not sure, says that uh, he's a very caring person and the people paint him out to be a character without letting him, you know, uh, just act as a human being. Which, unfortunately, he does that to himself with some of the dumb shit he says on podcasts and being out in public and doing dumb shit, not being accountable for his own actions. That's his own fault. That's not really wrestling fans' fault or the media's fault or whatever. It's Ric Flair's own fault for acting as if he is Ric Flair, not being Richard Fleer at any point in the last 20 years. Charlotte looks up to him as dad. Uh, Rick said that his health right now is phenomenal, which I find hard to believe, but that's what he says. And he says he he defines identity when asked what identity means to him. That means waking up and feeling good about yourself, which he has never been able to do, he says. He said he has never woken up and felt good about himself. And that was really the note they end on when they ask, like, who are you, Richard Fleer or Ric Flair? And then he contemplates it, and then it ends. And then in the credits, they say that he's claimed to have wrestled 8,000 times. They (laughs) they didn't include the line from the ESPN doc where he said that he has slept with 10,000 women, which... 
I'm not even sure is possible, but it's Ric Flair, so who cares? They also acknowledge in the credits that he had his last match, quote-unquote, in July of 2022. So they do mention Ric Flair's last match, although they also acknowledge the event he took part in about a week later in Puerto Rico, where he didn't wrestle, but he kind of made it known, I'm never going to retire. And then they show the tweet that he put out in September saying, I will never retire. So (laughs) the man cannot be helped. Um, That was the doc in a nutshell. I thought it was actually very well produced. This was a lot better than I thought it would be. How much did I really learn about Rick? Not much. The only stuff I learned about Rick was in the first five minutes when they talked about his early upbringing, uh, being adopted, his parents, uh, stuff like that. Beyond that, the wrestling stuff has been very well documented in the last 15, 20 years, from the plane crash to uh, evolution to the war horsemen. Even the drinking stuff has been very well documented, including in the ESPN doc from five years ago. The only thing... I, I don't know if that doc had the health issues, though, from early or from mid-2017. I think they did, because I want to say that came out in late 2017. He had his health scare in mid-2017. So I'm pretty sure that was talked about and acknowledged as well. But um, like I said earlier, they don't include the plane ride from hell stuff. They don't talk about his TNA run, among other things. And it was still pretty hefty. It was almost nearly two hours in length. So it wasn't like they were... You know, they only had an hour-long runtime. This was a pretty long documentary. To add any more would have been a lot, sure. It would have been like two and a half hours. His fucking Broken Skull Sessions was like almost two hours long as well with Steve Austin two or three years ago. But um, still, this still ended up being pretty good. I would well recommend checking it out. And it, it is a bit tough to understand what he's saying at certain points because he... I, I don't know if it's just his speech or he slurs his words or whatever. Um... I don't know if you can watch this with captions. Ric Flair has always been a little bit difficult to understand, but like specifically in this fucking thing, um, I had to rewind it a couple times to really hear what he said because it's it's hard to understand what he's saying. I don't know if it was like a stroke or what. I think it was. I'm not exactly sure. Uh, only want to speculate. I don't know. But regardless, I thought this was well worth checking out. A very good piece of business here. You don't really learn a lot of new information about Ric Flair but it was uh, worth the two hours I spent watching it, and I enjoyed it. So uh, that was Ric Flair's, or rather, I almost said Ric Flair's last match. Woo, Becoming Ric Flair is what it's called on Peacock right now. And thank you guys for checking out my review of said special. I appreciate it. Be sure to like the video, drop a comment, share the video, and subscribe to the channel for more daily content. We're going to have an all-new video, I mean, every day going forward, but specifically Friday, John Ritland returns here to the channel to help me break down the best, the worst, Uh, The good, the bad, and the ugly of 2022 in movies. So stay tuned for that here on Friday, among other videos dropping here on the channel in the days and weeks to come. Have an awesome one, guys. I'm Graham G. Matthews. Have a very happy new year, and I'll catch your ass down the road.